Oh yeah. Subscribe to Stevensville Gamers, my dudes. To another episode of Game Design Talks. You better give everything you've got for this wet-ass game design. Um, today, we are going to be discussing randomness in game design. Now, um, randomness is an important tool for you to be able to use when designing a game, and it's an important slider to sort of have your, have your mind um, focusing on. Um, you want to be thinking about how the random elements you're including in your game affect your players, what kind of players might enjoy them, what kind of players might not enjoy them, and what methods you can include to either increase or mitigate randomness in your game design so that your players can sort of customize their experience to a level that will um, make them excited without frustrating them. So uh, with that in mind, we're going to talk about what randomness in game design is, who it's for, when you should employ more of it, and when you should try to mitigate it. So what is randomness? So randomness is an element of the game that is out of the control of any player experiencing the game. Um, now, if this is a single player game, then it just means that it's out of control of the player. If it's a two player game, it means that it's out of the control of either of the players. Um, now, this doesn't mean that one player didn't choose to instigate the randomness. For example, if you're playing um, a game of Smash and someone picks Peach and they're using her down special, they're going to get a random turnip that does a random amount of damage out of the ground. They chose to initiate that randomness, but it was still out of the control of either of the players. Um, now, it can range anywhere from an attack having a chance to miss in an RPG to a deck being shuffled in a card game. So randomness is a lot of different things over the course of a game, and a lot of those can be mitigated. It has its place in its game design and can be a great tool in making sure that your game is fun for a wider audience. So let's uh, sort of dissect that. Think about um, when randomness makes your game more fun. When is randomness useful? When you want to create a casual experience. When you want to reduce the value of skill or strategy to narrow the gap between more and less skilled players. So this is a really important point. Randomness is always going to benefit the worst player, be that the less experienced player, the less skilled player, or just the player who is the worst in that matchup in a fighting game or a card game. Randomness is always going to benefit the worst player. Now, that's that can be good in a lot of situations. If you want to create a game that's intended to be sort of a party game where friends just kind of sit around it and play together, then randomness is really useful because in that setting, you don't want one person winning all the time because that will frustrate the other party guests. Um, and also when you want to make a game more fun to spectate. Um, so Hearthstone was the first um, digital card game to become really successful in esports, and a large part of that was because of all the random elements that were involved. You had cards that added random other cards to your hand, you had cards that discovered other cards. At the peak of randomness in Hearthstone, there was a card called Yogg Saron, and it cost the maximum amount of mana, and when you played it, um, it casted uh, a random spell for every spell you had cast that game. So that's just a huge amount of variance. Um, and it was fun to watch on Twitch or with Spectator, but almost every deck included one. And when you would sit down for a game of Hearthstone at high levels, everyone would be playing Yogg Saron because it was a way to sort of reset the game. And sometimes you would win or lose off of the back of Yogg, and that just wasn't fun gameplay at the highest levels because it took the game out completely out of the hands of either player. And so Yogg Saron was nerfed into unplayability um, in that if any of the spells that he casts transform or destroy him, then he stops casting spells. Um, because normally he would cast 20 to 25 spells um, every time that you play him. So when you want to make a game more fun to spectate, you can increase the randomness. Or when you want to make a game more fun for a casual setting, um, when you want to mitigate the role of skill. Um, the role of skill and the role of randomness are, are pretty much um, inverse 
Um, the more that you increase randomness in your game, the less that skill or strategy will matter. And you don't always want skill or strategy to be the only factor that matters. In a competitive game, you do want skill or strategy to largely be the factor that matters. But if you're, if you're designing a casual game experience, you want to reduce the value of skill and strategy so as not to frustrate players who have not invested themselves in your game. And that's where you want to have a large amount of randomness. Think Mario Party. Um, so that's when randomness is useful. Let's talk about when randomness becomes an obstacle. So this is one of my favorite examples. Consider the last slice of pizza. You're in a dimly lit room that smells like cigarettes and energy drinks on a Saturday night in the early 2000s. You're playing Smash with the homies and having a good time when someone wants to play you for that last slice of pizza. But that's not all. He wants to turn off items and play on Final Destination. Why is this? Players invested in your game want to be rewarded. If the player playing you for the last slice of pizza is the best Smash player in the room, or if he believes he's the best Smash player in the room, he certainly doesn't want to lose to a scrub like you grabbing a Pokeball that has a Caesar in it, or falling off the boat on that awful Super Mario 64 stage. He's spent a long time learning the game's mechanics, so the party is over for him, and it's his time to really earn that last slice of pizza. This can be carried over into large stakes, um, and it remains true that as players become more skilled, they generally tend to want to mitigate randomness. Um, if a player's goal is to show off their skill, or to prove that they are the best at your game, or that they know your game the best, they're going to want to remove as many of those random mechanics as possible. You know, they're not going to want to play Mario Party, because you can't prove you're the best Mario Party player when Bowser comes out of nowhere when you land on the wrong... Um, space and just takes all your coins. You had nothing to do with that decision, it was completely random. You can't prove that you know the game very well. That's just not tenable to a competitive game. So randomness being a non-factor or very little of a factor is something that you're going to want to shoot for if you want to create a competitive experience where player skill and player strategy matter the most. Like we mentioned earlier, it's sort of a sliding scale with, with randomness on one end and skill on the other, and I don't want that to sound like that means randomness is bad and you should always shoot for a completely skill and strategy focused gameplay, but you do have to be aware that as you increase the role of randomness in your game, or the role of luck as it were, um, you are decreasing the role of skill in your game. So that's better for casual settings. Um, so the other example that people give that I want to go over real quick is, is beer pong. Um, you're playing beer pong in your dorm basement or wherever, um, and it becomes uh, who, who has to pay for the next six-pack. So now you have to make sure that the ping pong table is aligned correctly, that it's not slanted, that all of the cups have the same amount in them, that everybody's using the same type of ball that has the same weight. Um, you get a lot more serious about it. You want to mitigate randomness or factors that are out of your player control as soon as the stakes are higher. Um, and this, of course, goes all the way into high-level competitive events um, for these kinds of games. So what games are successful with a lot of randomness? And let's talk about why. Mario Kart is incredibly random, and it does not have a competitive scene, but it is a very popular casual game. It's very... Um, it, it's one of the games that people go to, especially in terms of racing games, it's one of the things that people go to um, at parties, and they, they, everybody, everybody wants to play Mario Kart. You know, you're at a party, you're having fun, you get out a game, it's probably going to be Mario Kart, um, if it's a video game, if not like Smash Brothers, um, just because it creates such a casual environment. You never, you never really get to flex your Mario Kart skills because somebody can get a bullet bill and just rock it to first for free, which would be infuriating if there were a competitive Mario Kart scene, but there's not. It's just a casual game to play at parties, and it's very, very good at being that. Same with the game of life. Um, it's a nice game to play with your kids because, you know, even if they're behind, somebody could get um, a tree falling on their house and be in debt, kind of like in real life. Um, so you never feel like you're down and out in that game because something could happen to one of your opponents that could cause you to win or something could happen to you you can win the lottery in the game of life there's just a lot of things that are completely out of your control in that game you can make enough meaningful decisions that you can say that oh well i chose to go to college at the beginning of the game and that made me uh, this much wealthier later 
there are enough decisions that you can say your decisions mattered in the game of life, but there's enough, there, there's, there's, it's vastly more random. Um, and that creates a sort of gameplay where you never have to feel like you're down and out, and you never get to feel like you're safely ahead. Which is great for a casual environment. Um, Hearthstone has a lot of randomness. They've toned it down a little bit since, but a lot of the mechanics create random cards from outside of the game that fit a certain criteria and put them in your hand. Um, or summon them to the field, uh, and that was a point of contention for a while. It was very successful with the spectator crowd, but um, competitive players would play for a short time and then leave very quickly because they didn't feel like they were in control of the game. They felt like the game was, some of them would say, an RNG fest, uh, random number generation, uh, and would quit the game because it felt like their decisions didn't matter and it was coming down to a coin flip, these big games that... Um, these big games that were had a lot of money on the line. Um, but this game remains incredibly popular with the casual crowd. Um, and then Super Mario Party. Mario Party is probably the epitome of randomness. I mentioned it earlier, but there are spaces you can land on that just take away all your coins or let you steal stars from the other player. Um, there's mini games which have the illusion of mattering. Uh, and those are skill-based individually. Um, they, within the mini games, those are skill-based. Um, and you earn some coins uh, at the end of them. But those coins can just be taken from you or doubled or tripled or anything else can happen to you over the course of the game. Um, skill does not really matter in Mario Party. You can win every mini game and still lose. Um, just based on what chance spaces you happen to land on. Um, so Mario Party is a great party game. If, if the people playing it aren't paying super close attention to it and they're just kind of having fun with the mini games, then Super Mario Party, or any, any Mario Party game for that matter, can be pretty fun. Um, and it, it, it's definitely a party game. There's not really a competitive Mario Party scene, um, not that I'm aware of. Um, but it's, it's, it's a casual game with a large, large quotient of randomness. So which games are successful with little to no randomness? So I mean this commercially successful, culturally successful, and just are good games. That's why Pikmin's on there, because it's not super well known, but it's one of my favorites, and I think it fits this bill perfectly. So chess has little to no randomness. In some games, I understand you randomly choose who plays white and who plays black, which dictates who goes first and who goes second. But both players have exactly the same pieces, um that can do exactly the same things. There's no rolling a die to decide which piece you move first or how many spaces a piece can move. It is literally strategy all the way. No randomness and no um, physical skill. Chess is one of the most popular games ever, and it stood the test of time. But casual chess is a bit of a misnomer, I would say. Um, you might just play a game of chess for fun, but you're never playing a game of chess necessarily for the enjoyment of chess. I feel like you're usually playing a game of chess to beat someone at chess. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think that, that chess is successful with little to no randomness because it cultivates a competitive atmosphere almost immediately. You know everything your opponent can do, your opponent knows everything you can do, the heat is on, and you have to just show them that you're better at chess. I think um, the lack of randomness lends itself to an automatic competitive attitude with chess. And that's why it has survived so long as the sort of game, the, the, the not stereotype, but the, the feel of chess is that you're trying to outwit your opponent. And if you're looking for that feeling, chess is one of the best games where that can happen. Um, Plants vs. Zombies I've got here as a stand-in for any like tower defense or fast-paced resource management type strategy game. Um, these types of games rely on little to no randomness. You gather resources at a set pace and use them to build um, obstacles and towers that um, sort of stop an onslaught, wave, waves of enemies, um, which defeating them gives you more resources to upgrade your towers, and then that's the gameplay loop. You continue to, to upgrade your towers to stop the, the waves of enemies. Um, these games have little to no randomness, and they are successful because, they, they, they rely on that little to no randomness because the uh, gameplay loop needs to be repeatable flawlessly. Um, essentially, if you lose, if your defenses are not good enough, you need to figure out where you went wrong, and you can't usually do that if 
replicating your gameplay, replicating your setup, your loadout from the last playthrough, um, requires you to land the same way in RNG. So there's very little, um, think Plants vs. Zombies, Bloons, Tower Defense, those kinds of games that you would play in your, uh, those flash games you would play during elementary and middle school, um, or as an adult, because they're fun. Um, but basically, um, if, 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 if building your loadout was reliant on randomness, um, those games would just be more frustrating than fun because if you need to get back to a certain point and then make a different decision to make your loadout better to defeat that whatever wave of enemies you lost on, but you need to rely on landing on the same random number, then um, the game is not going to be fun because the whole point is to um, sort of rehash and fix your loadout until you can defeat that wave of enemies. Um, with Pikmin... There is very little randomness because, or in the case of Pikmin 1 and 3, there's no randomness to my knowledge. Um, you have to execute these perfect strategies, and in the same vein as tower defense games, it's, um, it's about perfecting your strategy. And if your strategy is contingent on some sort of RNG, you're not going to be able to repeat it and refine it. Um, so a lot of these games that rely on repeating and refining a strategy um, don't do well with RNG, um, now, Pikmin is a single-player game. It's not really a competitive game at all, unless you're considering, like, speedruns or, or no-death runs, like, competing on the basis of how well you did in your playthrough. But, um, it is, it is largely a single-player game, so, um, the lack of randomness is interesting here, because maybe you would think of it as a casual experience, but the lack of randomness is necessary to this game, because, again, it's about repeating and refining a strategy which requires you to be able to repeat up to the point that you need to change. And that's important. If your game is about repeating and refining a strategy, you want to mitigate randomness entirely or make it only a player option, something that they get to choose. Because if your core gameplay loop and what the thing that you intend for your players to find satisfying about your game is repeating and refining a strategy, then randomness is just going to get in the way of that. Um, you need them to be able to I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. You need them to be able to um, repeat their strategy up to the point where it went wrong and then fix that. Uh, and then Tic-Tac-Toe is the other game that's successful with little to no randomness. Not successful in that there's competitive Tic-Tac-Toe. Obviously, if both players are equally good at the game, it will always end in a stalemate. But successful in that literally everyone knows how to play by the time that they hit age six, you know. It's a, it's a culturally relevant game because it's, it's the way that you, like, settle some things or just when you're bored on the airplane, you play tic-tac-toe with the person next to you. Uh, and it uses little to no randomness because it can't really. It's such a simplistic, bare-bones game. Um, but that is, that is an example of a game that doesn't use any randomness that's very culturally relevant. And so what is the lesson that we can take from this? And what I've written here... Chess is not a game that is friendly for casual players or fun at parties. Mario Kart doesn't have a competitive scene aside from its single-player time trial mode. These games are successful, but only to one type of player and only on one extreme, generally. You should aim to make luck a determining factor for the players who want a more casual experience, but allow it to be pushed into the background when players want to be rewarded for learning your game mechanics. There's no reason not to make a game that appeals to both casual observers and enfranchised players. And the two, the two examples I've got here of games that do that well is the item switch on, on Super Smash Bros. Melee. You can turn off each of the items if you don't want to play with them. And in competitive, you turn off all the items. But if you want a casual experience where people are healing with food, hitting each other with warp stars, throwing around Pokeballs, you can turn on all the items or whichever ones are fun to you and then kind of go crazy. And then I've got fetch lands here. So Magic the Gathering is a trading card game, right? And at the highest levels of competitive play, people are doing everything that they can to mitigate randomness. They're playing these fetch lands, which allow them to fix their mana bases so they can play three color decks because these fetch lands can grab a land that is half of the color on the fetch land and half the color that they need. Um, so literally all of these fetch lands grab any of their mana and they thin their decks out. And you'll also notice that at the highest level of competitive play, most cards are played in play sets or the maximum number of, car of that card, copies of that card you're allowed to play. And that's true for Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon. Pokemon less so, because there's a lot of searching. But Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, Vanguard. Um, any, any successful trading card game, like at the highest levels of competitive play, is played to mitigate randomness. You're playing it with 
um, the maximum co number of copies of a card. Um, but then there's, on the casual end of the spectrum, for Magic at least, there's EDH, where it's uh, four players, and they're all playing a hundred card deck with only one copy of each non-basic land card. So those players want a casual experience. They're very unlikely to see any given card in any game because they're playing a hundred cards and all of them are unique except their basic lands. Um, and they have to play against three other players who might pull any given card from their 100 card singleton deck. So Magic is good because it gives players a way to decide how much randomness is involved in the game. If you want a fun casual experience, you play EDH or you play Cube and those um, grant you that fun, casual, sort of unpredictable experience. Uh, and if you want a competitive experience, you can mitigate luck by playing a 60-card format where you play play sets of all your best cards, and you play fetch lands to thin out your deck. So that's the lesson that we can take from this, really. Um, if you want to design a game for a competitive or serious or enfranchised player only, then you should mitigate luck to zero. If you want to design a fun, casual party game that you absolutely do not want people to take seriously, you do not want people to play competitively, then ramp up that luck as much as possible. And if you want to design a game that can appeal to either of those demographics, like a Super Smash Brothers or a Magic the Gathering, you have to make luck something that is within player control. You have to give them a way to decide how much luck they want and how much sort of serious competitive experience they want. You also have to make both of those options fun. And that's another thing entirely. Um, you have to make it so that when you're playing competitively, it didn't feel like an afterthought, where the game was very obviously designed to be played with these luck mechanics. And you also have to make sure that the, the, the casual party version of your game does not feel like an afterthought. You have to design each part of your game intentionally. Um, and not make it feel like it was tacked on to appeal to another audience. So those are the lessons that we can take from this. Um, from involving your involving randomness in your game design, what purpose it serves, who it serves, what kind of players are attracted to that random gameplay, and what kind of players are going to be attracted to gameplay where randomness is mitigated. I want to thank you all sincerely for watching. I have been War Crimes Uwu on Twitch. Um, I'm also the co-host of the Magic the Gathering podcast, Gut Shot, with aggressive rhetoric, which you can find a lot of places. Spotify, YouTube, um, SoundCloud, um, wherever you get your Apple podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find Gut Shot. And we, we pump out a new episode every Sunday, so if you like Magic the Gathering, check that out. Uh, and I've been here uh, on Stevensville Gamers. Um, if you want to drop uh, something in the comments, letting me know how you feel. Do you prefer that casual, random sort of game design, or do you prefer that competitive, um, very serious, randomness is mitigated game design? Which of those kinds of gameplay do you find more fun, and which of those gameplay do you find um, easier to design for? Let me know in the comments, and thank you so much for watching, and have a good day.